27th um, joint meeting with the trustees but board is now called to order okay and i'd like to call the village trustees to order at six o'clock on uh wednesday march 27th the first item on our agenda um and for anybody who would like to follow along with the agenda if you go over there it is online on the town website there is a qr code there because we're environmentally friendly around here um <laughs> there's a qr code there if you scan that uh it'll take you to the agendas page and then you can bring that up the wi-fi password is up there um so if you need to get onto the wi-fi please go ahead uh, so, first item on the agenda tonight is additions and deletions from the agenda. Are there additions or deletions? Yep, I have two. And I'd like to move them up to the top of the agenda if possible. Uh, one is an update on uh, the trustees and someone stepping down. Um, and the other is a vote by the select board for a letter of support uh, for a possible grant for the main supply plant. Okay. Trustees, are you okay with moving that up to the top of the agenda? Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. Yes. Okay. Um, so our engineers who have been working on the maintenance water plant are also working with the energy coordinator uh, to fill out a grant to go through uh, one of the senators' office in Vermont for a potential uh, congressional appropriation uh, for the main wastewater plant. Uh, they need a letter of support from the select board. Uh, they don't have the letter done yet, but it's due on April 9th. So I'm asking as a board to give the chair permission to sign that letter when it's ready. Um, and I'm asking for a vote on that tonight. Uh, yes. There a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Uh, next one. Um, as some people may know, Bill Corson has decided to step down from the trustees uh, effectively on April 1st. Uh, we all want to thank him for his service uh, and also his pickleball uh, expertise as well. Um, so the uh, trustees have to go through the process of uh, finding a new trustee. Uh, my recommendation, as it was to the select board, um, is to go through an application process and interviews. Um, I understand there's some uh, different opinions on that. Uh, so we're requesting a meeting Friday morning, uh, 845, of the trustees to kind of discuss next steps. Um, if that's amenable, we'll warn tomorrow morning and go from there. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Any other additions or deletions to the agenda? No. Okay. Um, then next we're going to move on to a discussion of the, it's actually more of a, just a, ref a refresher on the conflict of interest for the town and the village. Eric, do you want to walk up with that? Yes. Do you mind if I go up top of you? Please. Tell us your name and where you're from. Yeah. Eric Duffy, 31 The Green. <laughs> Um, so I've been asked to kind of give an update on the conflict of interest policy for Woodstock. Um, as we know, there's a few new board members uh, joining us. We're all very thankful for, uh, but also to try and look at March, April as the time every year we kind of have a refresher on what it means to be a board member. Um, and one of those is conflict of interest. Um, as we'll talk later on today, we're also going to talk about goals and objectives going forward in future meetings. Um, but kind of a history of conflict of interest. Uh, the last one was signed in 2017. Um, the authority is granted under state statute. Um, it applies to all public officers. Um, in other words, like board trustees, uh, but also it filters down to any kind of committee we have or commission as well. Um, the purpose of this, this is the language that's actually in the conflict of interest policy. Uh, you can read it, but basically is to ensure that uh, any vote taken is a vote taken for the best interest in the municipality, uh, not a vote that would enrich anyone um, or give anyone gifts. Um, so anything that would impact a board member financially or a family member or a close friend or a relative, um, they should recuse themselves and not be a part of that vote as, as it could be seen the vote is for themselves and not for the municipality. Uh, there are some exceptions to that, like the tax rates obviously impacts everyone. So a board member can vote for that. Um, but if a, someone is on, let's say, uh, the board at the Thompson Center, someone comes to the Thompson Center, that person should recuse himself to make sure the public sees that what they're doing is the best interest of the municipality, not the Thompson Center. Um, again, so this is kind of the direct or indirect personal or financial interest of a public officer. Um, so again, it's kind of being aware of how it could be perceived, but also if you have any, I think, any financial interests, 
that's when you, you should kind of step down. Um, so if you have a uh, if you have a conflict, you should not participate in any official action. Uh, so that not only means recusing yourself, it also means not being involved in the conversation at all. So once you kind of recognize that you have a conflict, um, it's not just say I'm not going to vote on it. You should actually take yourself out of the conversation. The current policy actually asks, asks you to kind of leave the table and sit down as a member of the public while the conversation goes on. Uh, again, to show you don't have any due influence on the conversation. Um, also, not accept any gifts. Uh, don't negotiate for a private entity if they're going to come in front of the board. Um, and not to use any resources that are unavailable to the public. Um, so you can't use your role as a board member to uh, use DPW equipment to have your drive rate paved. Um, if you have a conflict, uh, this kind of policy that lays out, uh, one, you should uh, say that you have a, you have a conflict. Um, next, if you don't want to recuse yourself right away, you can have a conversation with the board about your conflict. Um, and that that conversation can then decide if that conflict is enough for you to step down or if people think that you can still be fair and impartial, you can then stay on the board. Um, when it comes to elected officials, um, we don't really have a punishment in there besides being talked to sternly by the chair, um, but that also can be done publicly as well. Um, appointed officers can actually be um, let go from office if they do not follow the conflict terms of policy. Um, so going forward, as I said, this is from 2017, so I would like to update this conflict interest policy. Um, I'd also like the boards to practice perceived conflict of interest as well. So not just a direct or indirect financial uh, benefit, but also what could be perceived as a conflict to be aware of those. You may not have to recuse yourself at all times, but at least to acknowledge it publicly shows that we are being transparent, and I think that'd be a good step for the board. Um, once the policy is updated, um, I'd like the board to vote on those policies and put, put in place new ones with this board, um, then also sign the conflict saying that we agree to follow it as well. Um, so that's a very quick overview of our policy. I'm happy to take any quick questions if you want. I know we have very limited time, but I'm happy to answer any questions the boards have at this time. Thank you. No, good. Okay, so we're perfect. No conflicts ever. Um, so uh, we're here for um, an update from the Planning Commission. Um, so this is kind of how the rest of the meeting will go. Uh, we do have a hard stop at 7.30 for another meeting. Um, so we try to make sure everyone is heard. Uh, we will be collecting questions um, and then provide answers to those questions if we don't have time to get to, get to them all tonight. Um, so first we'll have the Planning Commission presentation, um, then technical questions from the select board, technical questions from the trustees, Technical questions about the ordinance from the public. We're going to try to limit that two minutes per person. Um, and cause consolidation of questions. Um, two minutes of public comments, if there are any. Um, a vote on the continuation of the moratorium. Um, and then, if time allows, a planning of uh, future joint meetings uh, for the boards to talk about goals and objectives. Um, and before I turn it over to the Planning Commission for the presentation, um, I just kind of want to go over something. Uh, I think there's been some confusion on what the planning commission is and how they operate. Um, so it's the state statute that gives the planning commission the, the power. Um, and basically they act as a body to give advice, um, amendments, ordinances to the legislative bodies so then they can do what they want to do. Um, as we know, board members usually have full-time jobs, they're busy, so they can task the commission like the planning commission to go out, do the research, do the leg work, find recommendations, find ordinances, do all that work, go through public meetings, and then present those findings to the board, and the board then gets to do what they want from that point on. Um, so that's kind of where we're at right now. The Planning Commission has been meeting for over a year on this. Um, they've had at least 10 public meetings where short-term rentals has been the main topic, um, and then many more meetings outside of that where there have been secondary topics as well. Um, this is the first time they're really coming to the select board and, and, and the trustees, uh, but this has been going on over the last year, and the last meeting was just two nights ago, Monday night. Um, so they're here now for this presentation. Um, the boards have a tentative date in late April to potentially vote on this ordinance, um, and in that meantime, there'll be planning times for the planning commission and the planning zone office to answer questions to the board members, but also to the public. 
Um, with that said, I'll turn it over to the Planning Commission. All right. Um, yeah, Nikki, can you uh, make Stephen uh, able to share his thing? He should be able to. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Benjamin Pauly. I am the chair of the Planning Commission as of Monday. So, um, on Monday's meeting, which is the first one I, I led, we learned um, people have different ticks about being nervous. Mine is being uh, a fast talker. And I also have to go to the bathroom when it happens. So I will talk slowly and I'm dehydrated. So it should be good. <laughs> okay. So um, tonight we're going through our proposal for short term rental ordinance. Um, and I uh, want to click through the next slide as we run. Um, so we'll kind of start with the basics of um, kind of where we were and um, where we are. Um, back in February of 2023, the Planning Commission began to set, uh, setting the stage to evaluate the short-term rental policies. Uh, we knew it was about four years since the last major changes to the regulations. Um, there's been significant increase in short-term rental activity that has happened um, that hasn't been permitted. Uh, there are major gaps in both the regulations and their enforceability. There are multiple processes and too many categories for the operators to fall under. And like the entire state, um, Woodstock has a critical lack of housing to meet our community's need. And the housing market has significantly changed, um, uh, specifically in the last couple of years. So um, next slide. Um, we um, had several guiding objectives the entire time we were looking at these short-term rentals. Um, and they were to promote the, and protect the health, safety, welfare, and convenience of our residents and visitors. Uh, preserve Woodstock's sense of place, limit the number of non-compliant operators and properties being converted to short-term rentals while allowing existing operators to, who followed all the rules, a simplified way of keeping doing what they're doing, uh, balance the need of rights of operators and neighbors, and create incentives for the conversion of short-term rentals to long-term housing. So those are kind of our guiding objectives from the beginning. And um, over this process, over those all those meetings, we've heard from a lot of different people, um, people who have permits, people who um, uh, don't have permits, people who are uh, grandfathered, um, which is a you know pre-existing non-conforming use, uh, long-term renters who lost their housing to short-term rentals, um, short-term rental advocacy groups, long-term housing advocates, state legislators working on regulate short-term rentals at the state level, property manager companies, non-compliant op operators, prospective operators, and operators who may not or would not receive a permit if this ordinance was um, enacted. So really want to state our mission really was to find a balance between all these. Um, we had very passionate community members. Most of them um, are in this room right now about short-term rentals and how it affects their livelihood. And our goal is really to um, take those um, things that everybody shared in here uh, and stories on a personal level from people who are affected by them, the people who benefit from short-term rentals, and try to make something that really worked for the town of Woodstock. Um, I, everybody knows uh, the housing market and the lack of affordable housing in Woodstock. Um, in no way are we saying short-term rentals are responsibility um, of all of that, nor do we think that um, eliminating all short-term rentals outright would fix the situation. So there's there's not an extreme that we are considering at any time. We weren't allowing a free-for-all and we weren't going to restrict um, no short-term rentals from happening like New York City. Um, we're trying to find a balance. So in that balance, we um, in that process, we've, through all those meetings, have looked um, at um, uh, those were our objectives. Our, our guiding principles were uh, continuity. Um, we heard from a lot of people who have existing permits, a lot of people who are, are pre-existing non-conforming use, and they're in good standing. We wanted to allow for the co continuity of those people to continue to do their rentals and have knowledge that they would be able to continue to do their rentals um, with this proposed ordinance. 
Uh, second thing is we wanted to cover the cost. Cost is a very big issue. Um, there are a lot of uh, fixed and variable costs associated with um, an ordinance um, like this. And we find that um, it's very necessary for us to account for that variability and have the fee structure cover to the entirety of that cost so that there's no possibility that any costs for managing this um, ordinance would fall on the taxpayer. Um, limit the impacts. There's a lot of limit, limit the impacts. Um, uh, big one is to stop the loss of um, long-term housing. And that can be um, you know, a long-term rental turning into a short-term rental. It can be uh, somebody buying a home as an investment property as a second home and using it as a short-term rental when they're not here. Um, it could be a uh, investment company buying a property and um, uh, using it as an investment for short-term rentals. Um, I, I will admit we don't have a lot of evidence that there is a ton of corporate investment in Woodstock in long-term rentals. Um, you could argue that Stowe probably has a lot of investment in um, outside um, entities into the short-term rentals. Our goal is really to get ahead of any issues that are popping up in a lot of cities and towns across the United States and having um, unregulated short-term rental um, policy. So um, there also is um, the reality that short-term rentals can have a, a negative impact on rents and, and property values um, because of the perceived um, ability to um, earn income from them and, um, and generate revenue um, and also by lessening the housing stock that's out there. So it just becomes a more competitive process. Um, and in limiting the impacts, uh, we have a number that we recommended to limit them to, um, and it's kind of in the 5% to 6% range. Um, Vermont as a whole is about 3%. Um, and that 5 to 6% number came about from a lot of um, research looking at other models out there about um, how many uh, uh, regulations there are that limit either quantity or certain districts. Um, some rentals are allowed, some are not. Um, and that five to six number really was the comfort level that we felt was appropriate to our town. So if you lived on a street um, with 20 houses, one being a short-term rental seemed um, to feel comfortable. If you lived on a street and uh, of 10 houses and, and uh, one of them was a short-term rental, getting to 10%, it starts to feel that um, things might be out of balance. So we're trying to balance um, you know, the feel of the community and also people's ability to have short-term rentals. Uh, conversion as well, um, we want to create an opportunity um, to incentivize short-term rentals to convert to long-term housing um, sim and simplify. Uh, we had kind of uh, complex regulations that had multiple zoning um, regulations depending on the district that you lived in. Uh, for example, in, in the village, you had a, you could rent four for four events or six events, excuse me, and then unlimited times during foliage if you live there um, on the uh, forestry and five acre in the town, um, there was kind of an unlimited time you could rental. So there was kind of a, a variation in um, what was allowed. So we're trying to get everybody under the same rules um, and making it uh, possible that somebody coming in and looking at the short-term rental market could know what the rules are. So there aren't any loopholes. Right now there's a bed and breakfast loophole that we're trying to close by redefining what a bed and breakfast is as well. And that was a recommended zoning change that's coming up. And the last one is compliance. Um, and in compliance, um, it's really about getting everybody on the same page and in the same view so that um, we're all looking at the same standards, whether it's how many times you can rent, um, to the safety standards, to the parking standards, to um, uh, what is allowed across the board. So we are, um, uh, as we'll get into the ordinance, recommending that um, everything kind of becomes simplified and really um, allow us, um, the village and the town, to be able to enforce um, a regulation that um, 
exists, um, arguably right now. Um, there's quite a bit of variation of being able to regulate because um, many uh, permit holders that are limited to six time rent more than six times. Um, there are people that follow the regulations. There's also a, a good number of people that um, are unregistered or not permitted that are operating in Woodstock right now. So um, just as a, as a, a point, um, we have looked at um, existing permits and um, people who fall into that pre-existing non-conforming use, which is people in um, the R5 and forestry districts, and determined that there's about 84 short-term rentals that are in good standing. So they have a permit or they are kind of a pre-existing non-conforming use. Um, but there are at times um, between 180 and 200 short-term rentals found um, on the market in Woodstock and it fluctuates depending on the time of year um, and where you're looking. And that's, and there's no, there's no um, um, uh, data really to show, um, you know, why people aren't permitted or um, the reason not, um, but there's also really not the capacity for um, us to enforce um, much on the current regulations. So, um, so the ordinance, look at it, very simple slide. We can think you can go right into it. So um, the summary of the ordinance, um, may just click all through them, get them all on the board at the same time, just so everybody can see it. Um, starting January 1st, um, if this is adopted, it's going to affect in 2025, every short-term rental will require an annual short-term rental registration. So um, right now it's, uh, uh, pretty much a one-time registration. Uh, we are proposing an annual registration. Uh, we are limiting to 55 owner-occupied and 55 non-owner-occupied short-term rentals. So that gets to 110, which is about 5% of the housing stock in Woodstock. Owner-occupied and non-owner-occupied, basically the difference is if it's you declare a homestead, you're owner-occupied. If you do not declare a homestead, you are not owner-occupied. Um, we, to the best of our certainty, believe that we have um, about 23 owner-occupied permits out there and 47 non-owner-occupied permits um, on the book, so 70 permits. Um, a couple notes, um, uh, pre-existing rural operators um, do not count towards that limit. So there, um, we had a lot of feedback from people who've been doing this for many, many years, and we're concerned about their ability to not be able to continue doing it. Um, we are allowing those people to continue um, forward, and it's not gonna count towards that number. We also are allowing people who have multiple um, units to still keep doing all their multiple units going forward. Again, we thought continuity was the most important thing. People who have, are in good standing or are permitted um, will allow to be to continue going forward. Um, in the new regulations, we are limiting it to one registration per person and one registration per parcel. Uh, again, um, uh, one of the things that we updated was the property rented for less than 14 days, year is not a short-term rental. We also heard feedback that there are some people out there who just do it very casually, just trying to um, lower their tax burden. Um, so if it's less than 14 days a year, um, you do not count or have to register for a short-term rental ordinance. Likewise, if you rent out for more than 30 days at a time, um, uh, furnished finder or just long rentals, you also don't have to um, register as a short-term rental. Um, and again, the ordinance creates continuity for existing permit holders and rural operators. So um, we heard a lot of comments on, on Monday about um, you know, this 110 number um, being this exclusive group of people who hold permits and they kind of hold the keys to short-term rental market. Um, in some ways, yes, that's important. And we are giving the avenue of the people who currently have them access to be in that group. Can, um, can you, Ben? Yes. Can we speed this up a little bit? I can, a man. A I, lot of folks here that would. I think but, go to the bathroom at least, but I can speed up. Okay. Um, so, um, 
Uh, we're also taking off unlimited bookings. That, you know, a short-term rental is a, um, you know, essentially is a business. So we are allowing people. Sorry, what's that? Oh, we're changing to unlimited. Yeah, currently it's not unlimited. There are restrictions, but uh, the new ordinance is proposing unlimited bookings. Um, registrations uh, are non-transferable um, as well. Um, so uh, again, we won't go through this too much in deep, but uh, essentially it is uh, gives the process of how somebody who has an existing permit now or is a pre-existing permit use has a first window to apply, and then anything that's left over is opened up to um, anybody else um, until we hit those maximums. Um, and then the next year, essentially everybody who was permitted the year before who wants to reapply gets first in line so that they can continue on. And if anything opens up, then there's a process to uh, add more people in. Um, fees, uh, any registration fees for non-owner occupied um, short-term rentals. Uh, we have a 3,000 base fee plus 250 um, per occupant fee, and that's uh, a one-time fee per year. So uh, if you have uh, a non-owner occupied short-term rental and it has two bedrooms and it was determined that it, your maximum occupancy by the fire marshal is four, um, that would be a $4,000 annual fee. Um, owner occupied short term rentals is $750, base fee plus $250 um, per occupant fee. Uh, fee waiver, again, um, continuity. Heard a lot of um, comments from people who are in uh, the rural um, um, category um, that those fees were um, hard to uh, uh, swallow. So, um, because everybody else is getting um, a big change, right? Before you only could rent six times um, plus the unlimited during foliage. Now you're unlimited, so your ability to generate incomes more. Um, that already existed in those rural operator zoning, so we're giving them a waiver fee of $2,000, um, but everybody still has to pay that $250 administration fee. Um, so next one, Stephen. Um, uh, the cost, so um, how we justify those fees, um, you know, the fixed and variable, and so there's variable fees in there, um, estimating around $145,000 per year. Um, there's a lot of time, uh, the uh, software costs um, that get up there. Um, it likely could be more, it could be less, um, but that's a pretty good number, $145,000. And anything above our costs um, to administer the ordinance is going towards funding the conversion of short-term rental housing to long-term housing. And then, um, so essentially, uh, conservatively, if we um, were um, conservative in our numbers, um, we're just shy of $200,000 revenue. Um, if we're being uh, very ambitious that everything is going to be feel, filled um, kind of with an average occupant per room, $316,000, um, realistically, we, we see maybe a number around 280. So we have kind of calculations that gets us to that. Um, the big thing is, is that a lot of, um, the last comment I'll leave us is, um, you know, we have 23 owner occupied um, permits right now. We're allowing 55. So there still is opportunity to grow in the owner occupied um, bucket, um, but pretty much fully anticipate that the non-owner occupied will probably fill up so um, and hit those caps. But everybody, again, who is currently permitted or um, qualifies the existing non-conform use will be in there. So that is the end of the nuts and bolts. Okay. Big question. One question. Um, if you're a pre-existing rural operator. So I'm sorry, oh, sorry. So I'm just um, so about how we were going to do the questions. We're going to go with the Eric went over it in the beginning. Yeah. Okay. So the, the board members be able to so ask. I'm writing it all down, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. So my question is if you're a pre existing rural operator and for some reason you have to take a year off, do you lose the fee waiver and the ability to sign up for I'll give that to uh, Stephen. Sure. Thanks, Ben. All right, uh, Stephen Bauer, Director of Planning, um, walking through all the technical parts of this. Uh, Susan, would you mind asking that question just to, again? Well, sure. So you're you're a pre-existing rural operator, so therefore can get a waiver and you get the early 
application dates and everything, but you have to take a year off. So one year you don't apply. Do you then lose the ability to get the waiver? You then have to pay full freight from now on and lose the ability to do the early sign on. Um, in that hypothetical, um, you would fall into the the category of of everyone else. We don't we don't have a, a continuance. Um, once we know who is in that window, uh, it's kind of a one time window. Um, so once you are in, you will be in. If you leave because you don't register, uh, it leaves with you. Um, so we're you know, the proposed ordinance is stipulating not more than one uh, SDR per owner, but how do you control for things like people with multiple LLCs? Yep, so uh, the ordinance itself has a way to, we call it a, a, a registrant, so a short-term rental registrant. So okay. it's either an agent, uh, could be a property owner, could be the owner it's themselves, where you actually sign an affidavit that says, uh, I only operate one. So even if you have multiple LLCs, we have a, a natural person attached to each one. And then what are the, you know, I know that our, one of our big goals is incentivize convert STRs to LTRs. But I, I don't really see that incentive in this proposed ordinance. Like it, to me, it feels a little bit like it's a heavy lift to our homeowners, but the, the cost is minimal to like anybody who has deeper pockets. So it feels a little bit punitive to the little guy, but like kind of incentive to the bigger guy who might want to have multiple STRs. So how are we incentivizing LTR? Yeah, so how we're incentivizing is most of the permits that we have, most of those people that we know about that Ben just talked about, those 84, um, we've worked in every way to say you're guaranteed. Everyone after that, not necessarily guaranteed. Um, so some of the people, some of the larger non-owner occupied homes that have been added in the last two to three years, what we're seeing is um, those are the people not necessarily, you know, I'm overgeneralizing here, but uh, there's there's a good population of them, whether that be for, for ignorance of the, of the regulations uh, um, or just coming from a different area and not, not knowing who to ask. Um, there's a group um, or potential investors coming in and seeing Woodstock as, as a place to invest uh, and, and flip for short-term rentals. Uh, that is the group that might be left out of this. Um, so we, we, have, we have pushed forward, not just because people are, are, are residents or, or Vermonters, but because there's a group of people, some of those who have been out of state this whole time, um, who, are, who have been doing it. And so the incentive is we guarantee a spot for you. We don't necessarily guarantee a spot for uh, those who are not doing it with a permit uh, or those that have come in um, and are or will be coming in after these go into effect. Um, so that's the biggest incentive is the continuity that Ben was talking about. Um, where we're even still thinking about those people that the door shuts on and we say, we don't have capacity for you, sorry, not owner occupied. Um, those people were saying part of these fees is going to a program uh, that, that we don't currently have. We don't know all the details about. Uh, that program will actually help in that incentivization to say, okay, you you were doing short term rentals before without a permit illegally. Um, we still empathize with your position that now you're no longer allowed to do it, but if you are still interested in renting and potentially renting, renting for long term, um, we can actually monetize, give them an investment, um, you know, or an, a, a monetary incentive to try and help with that process. So, yeah. I have one more quick question. Um, we talked about this this five percent of our homes being you know, potential SDRs, and then we talk about the distribution of those. So you know, it makes it's it's a different. It feels different if one house on a street is an STR. How are you controlling for? Or how do you propose to control for the distribution? Or have you thought about, you know, not more than one house per such such density in a in a HDR neighborhood or 
Yep. So we we looked at that multiple ways, multiple times, uh, to try and figure out how to do that. Um, and every time we kept coming back to the same principle that's in the purpose statement of simplify, simplify, simplify. Uh, and we found it really hard once you start saying, well, there's a district cap or a neighborhood cap. Well, how do we define that neighborhood? How is Linden Hill different than than uh, uh, than Long Hill Road? Um, those two different places, you say, well, you know, 5% of each of those has a much different impact. Um, so we realized that, you know, an area with high density short term rental, say, I don't know, uh, High Street, um, could happen again, but we said the most important thing overall for for our community is to just cap it at one number. Um, that's the most simplified. Um, that that could result in you know one neighborhood having a, you know having a good chunk, um, like most of South Woodstock on on the main strip now. Um, but we're also trying to just say that's an overall number. That's the that's the right cap. Thank you. Question. Oh, sorry. Do you want to? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're going to okay. go for it. Okay. Are you guys all? Yeah. Jeffrey, do you have a question? I have a question. Okay. Go right ahead. So, looking at your numbers, it would be uh, the fees are quite significant, and they add up to numbers that seems well beyond the cost of running a program, even with your description of some of it, but I don't know what the numbers are. Some of it will be left to incentivize long-term rental. What's the idea for the extra money that is being generated by this? So that sliding scale, the the one thing that is, that is well, the two things that are really fully variables are uh, legal and litigation fees, uh, and then the sliding scale for how much um, how much in an incentive program can be put in. Um, so. When I say the total cost is 145,000, um, that's um, accounting for about 1,200 hours of staff time. But we predict uh, annually this 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 would cost um, software um, related equipment, um, you know, time for travel and inspection, and and some of those things. Those are we can get a pretty good idea of of what those would cost. Uh, we call them fairly fixed costs. Uh, there's still some variable there, but we kind of have an idea. Uh, and then you have the the potential for um, legal fees. And so we, we don't know how much litigation we'll take on. Is that going to cost $4,000? Is that going to cost $80,000? Um, so what I've put in there in that $145,000 is, is roughly about $40,000 40, $40, to try and calculate for a budget. Um, and then we've got to kind of give a buffer for – um, kind of what we're coming today and promising to these boards is, look, this, even in those variable costs, this is not going to come back on the general taxpayer. Uh, this program itself will generate enough funds so that what we do with those funds, it's not going to cost. So we have to kind of overcompensate the costs um, in order to to generate enough to make sure that we cover anything that we may have missed or may come up or that variable grows. Uh, what's not included in that 145 is how much we put towards uh, incentivization um, for the conversion. That's fully what we have left over. That's where that program money comes from. So all potentially up to like $100,000. Yeah. So more uh, would go towards incentivization. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yep, that's that's the plan right now. So if that variable cost goes 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 up and it's more than 145, then incentivization has a lower, um, you know, ends up with a with a lower balance. Thank you. I just want to make two points on that too. Um, one, I will disagree with Stephen very quickly. That's not all the costs that are going to be associated with the Airbnbs. They're indirect costs. So there's infrastructure wear and tear by people staying in short-term rentals. There's wear and tear on the roads. There's potential more calls for police or EMT to go out to these places as well. So there are then time on other staff as well that filters through. Um, plan zone is not a silo. So money that comes in goes through our AR clerk. It goes to our finance director. 
Um, bills go through our, our AP person. I get involved in things. Nikki gets involved in things. Um, so there are other costs not associated with what they're showing right now that will also be impacted um, as we have 110 short-term rentals potentially. Um, that's one thing that I want to point out as well. We don't know what those costs are because, again, it depends on how things happen. Um, but there are more than 147,000. I would say there's at least 180,000, if not more, just on those things. Um, and we can't be sure of how much infrastructure we can't see is, in, is impacted as well because those pipes are under, on, underground. Uh, roads, you know, tear up depending on the weather as well. Um, so I'll make that point clear as well. Um, second, um, much of the chagrin of a lot of apartment heads, I view revenue differently. Uh, I don't look at projected revenue. I look at revenue actually comes in. So we're talking about what could happen uh, when we look at revenue internally. We look at what revenue actually does come in. So I want people to see these revenue numbers and think that's what we're going to get. We don't know what we're going to get until we get it. And that's how I do my budgeting. And that's how I'm going to continue to do my budgeting. So I want to make that clear as well. Thank you. Eric, Eric though, just in, in terms of what you just said, don't we currently have the same wear and tear on our infrastructure right now as when this, this, this was going to affect? How would that change? We currently have that many, or I, my understanding is more short-term rentals. Yeah, but if we want to look at what having short-term rentals in Woodstock costs, we have to look at the total costs as well. So when, right now we're not considering that, but I'm saying if we're considering the cost of everything, those costs should be associated with that as well. Does that make sense? Doesn't make sense to me just because I, I, uh, it's only that there's, I don't think there's any difference in the impact on what, on what we have right now. And if we change this. We're not charging for it right now. We're, we're, we're not, not, we're not going for it at all. I can speak we're to this. We're not going to get income either. I, if I could offer clarity on this, Jeffrey. Oh, okay. Oh, go ahead. So by lifting the limit of number of times uh, uh, the ability to rent that we currently have for short-term rentals, we're also increasing like the traffic we expect and the number of visitors we expect and the number of events we expect to be rented. And those have, as Eric mentioned, indirect costs on our infrastructure. Okay. Thank you, Laura. And with that, and with that being said, <clears throat> we also are bringing a lot more money into our community, whether it be people eating at restaurants or people shopping at stores. It's kind of what our whole town has been geared on for We're years, which is questions. tourism. We're just doing questions right now. Questions um, from the board. Yeah. Do you so, have a question? Okay. The question would be, what are we trying to gain here? What are we trying to do? What is what is the objective of all this? Do you want to bring up your first slide again? I, I don't need a slide. Well, they're, I think their first slide addressed what they were trying to do objective. with their principles and their objectives. I have a you want to bring that up? But what are we, what's the end goal here? Are we trying to gain more housing? Is you what we're trying to do? They did what they were trying to do. Their objectives. I saw those. Can you bring them? I don't are you looking for something? What else are you looking for besides that? I just asked a question. I think. Yeah. I asked a question. Okay, Stephen, I'll let you answer that. I hear, is, okay. I hear a question, and I also hear a, you want us to pull back up the don't need guiding that. objectives? I don't know which one. I'll let you decide who, who rules that. So my, and, and you tell me if I'm wrong, this is not, my understanding is that the answer to that question of what are we trying to do is answered in their objectives. Is that incorrect? Um, Totally fine if I'm wrong. Yeah, it's it's the it's we call those the the purpose of the ordinance. Um, I can read those off. I can I can summarize them. But I just want to make sure she gets her question answered. So is yeah, yeah. All right. Let's start with this. What is the incentive program designed to do? Uh, it's to <clears throat> number five uh, convert. Short-term rentals. So as, as you listen to Ben, there's going to be people that are shut out of this that are currently doing this. Whether or not that, because some people are doing this, a lot of people are doing this without a permit because are not following the rules. Um, eventually the door is going to close on those people with this mm -hmm. ordinance. Um, they're going to have to divest what it is they're doing. Um, we've, we've heard from those people and they wonder, is, is all I'm going to do my only option to just sell my home and leave? And we go, absolutely not. If you want to keep your home, 
um, there's other ways you can rent it. And furthermore, um, since we empathize with your position, we also want to create this programs where I can, so we can say, here's an incentive uh, to now rent it long term. Is the answer. Okay. Thank Do you, you have any other questions? Nope. Frank? Yeah. Um, I have a question about um, enforcement. My understanding is that enforcement has been, we've had rules, <laughs> slightly confusing rules, but we've had rules, but it's been, but there hasn't been much enforcement. So we now have all of these new proposed rules. How do you enforce 110 and the people who are not following the rules? How do you enforce that? Great question. Uh, so we've partnered with who we believe to be the the, the best company um, in the field, GovOS. Uh, we got passed to them because of their partnership that they have with uh, Vermont Short-Term Rental Alliance. Uh, Julie Marks directly gave me that that um, connection. Um, we interviewed a lot of people. They came out far on top, mostly because the, they're the best, and two, because of their Vermont connections. Um, they do for Rutland and Killington, and there are many others that are asking this question that are that are uh, asking for for our recommendation as well uh, of them. Um, so, what GovOS helps us do is they scrub the data from about eighty. Scrub means. Yeah, scrub means that they go through eighty to a hundred uh, short-term rental platforms, um, most famously Airbnb, Verbo. Um, but there's some other big ones. We, we don't want to stay here all night. Um, but there's from big to small, they they will do a scrub. So they go through an anal analysis. They have a team. Uh, every 10 minutes, they pull that data, they scrub it, and they say, it looks like this person is advertising, and we've cross-referenced in all the ways. And we've identified it to this address because they have all of our information, our grand list information, and they give me a report and say, this is who's there. So we will, we're about to start working towards identifying all of the short-term rentals that advertise in Woodstock. Also notice in the ordinance, um, you not only to operate, but to advertise a short-term rental uh, is something that you have to have a registration to do. And what are there, are there penalties? There are. Yeah. So if you uh, if you advertise or operate without a license, uh, or sorry, add a, without a registration, um, it's uh, up to eight hundred dollar fee. And yeah. who enforces that? You enforce that? Does he enforce that? Um, so it's mainly the I'll say the short term rental officer. Um, we have as a de default that it is the administrative officer, um, unless you all decide differently, which is perfectly fine. Um, but there's also other issuing. Uh, municipal officials. So that could be police officers uh, for the village. That can be a uh, town chief for the fire department. Um, and that can also be the municipal manager. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen, that, that fee is per day. Per offense. Oh. So each each day is a new offense. So you can't you can't write you know ten citations on the same day. Uh -huh. oh. You can only get one citation per day for the for that offense. So that's a maximum. So it could be. That is a maximum. You could set a warning and then be like, they yeah. do it. Like, oh, it's 100 bucks. Everything okay. in the plan is compliance. Okay. What we're trying to work towards is is compliance with the regulations. Okay. Trustee, do you have any other questions? For now, yeah. no. oh, um, Stephen, what is the cost for this database? Uh, it's about $30,000 a year. Um, starting and then it continues to go up from there um, on average between seven and ten percent. And that software was included in that FY25 budget that was approved at town meeting and village meeting. Yeah. You said the cost will go up five to ten percent every year? Uh, seven to ten. Oh, okay. And yes, that is that kind of average and common in this in this field. Okay. There's a there's a lot of cities and towns that are that are looking at how they manage short term rentals, so it's a good market to be in. Trustees, do you have any other questions? Uh, select board. No, we're all set. Okay, so next we're going to move on. Um, citizen 
questions. So this is questions, not comments. We will have time for comments later, assuming that there's time after the after the questions. We do have, as Eric said, there's a hard stop at 7.30. So we wanna make sure that we get hear from everybody. Um, we wanna hear from you once if there's time and you have a second question, we will, we will do that as time allows. So as Eric said in the beginning, um, we'll have you come up, ask your question, um, because again, we're running short on time. What we're gonna do is you're gonna ask your question. Ray and I will be writing those down so that we are keeping a list. Um, Susan will time everybody. Everybody gets two minutes to ask their question. And then what we'll do is if we get to the end and there's not, we will try to, we'll have them answer as many questions as they can. If they cannot answer all the questions tonight, we will write up the questions. We will post them publicly. We will give them to them. They will write down answers. They will provide those answers at the next trustees and select board meeting. We'll talk about if there's other venues that we can do that because we wanna make sure that every question tonight gets an answer. And if it's not tonight, it will be at an upcoming meeting and an upcoming postering. So if you don't get your question answered tonight, know that, that it will happen. We just wanna make sure that we get every, we wanna hear from everybody tonight. Um, and so with that, um, well, when you come up, please make sure that you come up here um, to the podium. We wanna make sure that people can see and hear you on Zoom. <laughs> um, and we're gonna ask you your name, um, where you live, and then um, if you, and if you own a short-term rental. So uh, if somebody would like to start. Um, do you want us to do a, make sure we do Zoom in person or do yeah, we'll, in person or we'll, Yeah, so we'll go back and forth. We'll do a person in the room and then we'll go to Zoom if there's a question there uh, and we'll go back and forth until we get through everybody. And again, I'll be writing down the questions. So I might ask you to repeat something to make sure that I'm getting everything correct. And Zoom people just raise your hand if you wanna ask a question. Okay. Susan, you ready to go? Okay, I've got my pen. Uh, who would like to speak first? Is there someone in the room? Okay. Okay, come on up and your name, please. Uh, Derek DeMoss, Woodstock resident, short-term rental owner, long-term rental owner. I have a lot of questions, so I'll just ask a couple and maybe just email you guys if we run out of time that way. Be great, thank fine. you. Perfect. Um, one question actually for Eric, I believe, uh, is wear and tear, uh, from, for example, Woodstock Inn being uh, figured in currently and collected, or is that something that's not um, being figured into anything? Hmm. Is there any legal justification to create an ordinance to eliminate non-conforming use of a property, prevent someone from using a property as they choose, or to eliminate- Can you slow down a little bit? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Give them an extra 30 seconds. I'm sorry. Maybe I'll just do a couple of questions. I'll email the rest. Okay, I know, so, but okay, yeah. so we, okay, I got the word legal. Go okay, ahead. legal justification okay. to create an ordinance to eliminate non-conforming use of a property, prevent someone from using their property as they choose, or eliminate business competition. Okay. I'll email that one too. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think if you emailed all your questions. De definitely. Yeah, if you have them written down, that'd be great. But yeah, yeah I, do, I do want to hear them out loud. Sure, can I Can I do one more? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. You got a couple, you got 30 seconds. Perfect. Yeah. Do you see any issues with zoning collecting the full year STR renewal fee, April 1st, 2024 through March 31st, 2025, and also requiring a proposed fee under the new ordinance that covers January 1st, 2025 to December 31st, 2025, with an overlap of three months that are getting double feed. Charging April to August and then? A April to Mar April to March and then July or June, January, that J, January to December. Okay. Right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Anyone else on Zoom? Or is it? Is no. there somebody on Zoom? I don't see anyone. No. Okay. We'll take the next person in the room, please. Hi. Uh, Mark Ariemo. I live on uh, Ender Randall Road. I'm not a, uh, I have no stake in the game. Um, what was your last name again? I'm sorry. Ariema. Okay. A U R I E M A. Okay. Down at the Ender Randall Road. I just have a question, just so I understand when you, with your presentation, that in rural five districts where I live, there is no limit, there will be no limit on how many STRs there can be. 
Is that correct? Yeah. It's a quick one. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, sorry. That, that's my oh, no. Okay. Yes or no answer. There's a total limit. So, the, no. The, there is no limit. There's, okay. If you had a short term rental, yes. you would not be limited to how many times you can rent. No, no. How many? How many? Right now, there's three within 500 yards of my house. Uh, yeah, so you know, so. Not a okay, there isn't. Okay. So there's, is it, do they still count toward the 55? Toward the one. Yeah. Unless they were doing it before 2020. Unless they're <laughs> Okay. Someone else in the room? Back, back yeah. I just want to make a point. We're trying to make sure the question is directed at the board so the board's turn the questions down yeah. at the end of yeah. that. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Marisa Serafini, and I have a short term rent. I have a home that I do short term rental in, and I'm registered for nine years. Um, I'm wondering if there's any analysis of the 110 that you say are registered or whatever the number is, how many of them could likely become. Um, long-term rentals or affordable housing it would be interesting to see what the potential benefit of your goal is to um you know turn over some of these homes that are currently being used for short-term rental how many could potentially become long-term is it five percent ten percent fifty percent a hundred percent uh that would be an interesting thing to know. And then just as a follow up on the costs of um, managing this program and these incremental costs. So if the program goes away and we have no short term rentals, where where there'll be will there be savings on wear and tear? Will they be offset by um, what was brought up earlier, the cost benefits of those people coming into town and shopping? Um, in the stores, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sorry, I just wanna make sure that I'm right. Sure. So your question is? So my question is, SCRs are eliminated? If they are eliminated, yes. Um, because I'm trying to get back to the cost of the town managing STRs. Okay. So if we eliminate them all, how much will we save? How much will the town save on accounting, uh, wear and tear and all these other things that you're now building into the $400,000 budget for operating short-term rentals. Okay, so you're asking if we if we eliminate short-term rentals. Well, we, will, will the town have savings? Not well, them? will the town have cost savings? A wear and tear, okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Well, it's not just wear and tear, whatever the four, will the $400,000 go away? So words, I, there'll be no- um, If there's no short-term rentals there's no, there's and no you don't manage have, them. You don't have anyone to manage it. So what's, if we don't have to manage them, what are the, what are the cost savings? Right now, we're saying it costs four. Someone has said we're estimating it's four hundred thousand dollars from wear and tear and legal fees and thirty thousand dollars. So, has that cost benefit been uh, made? Right. All right. Thank you. Just one point. This yeah. Seems at one twenty-seven, not for a thousand. So, so we have the number of expenses. It wasn't for a thousand dollars. It cost one hundred twenty-seven thousand. Okay. Th okay. That's a good point of clarification. The costs are not four hundred and fifty thousand. The the cost they did not say was four hundred fifty thousand. They said it was one hundred and forty four hundred forty five thousand. He was just correcting the the cost to administer the program is not four hundred fifty thousand dollars. It's one hundred and forty five thousand dollars. The intention is we're going to collect five thousand dollars. No, we're saying that. No, no, no. We'll, we'll, okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll write it down. Yeah, we'll. Okay. Okay. Hi. I'm Samantha Dinatelli, long time Woodstock, Vermont resident and small business owner um, in town. I do not have a short term rental. Um, I'm here to speak on the housing issues uh, in town in relations to staffing. Um, you have a question? I do have a question. Okay, okay. good. Um, what, what's the bed and breakfast loophole that was mentioned earlier? Um, does this, he, uh, South Woodstock was mentioned, is this also, and has there been any conversation with Bridgewater and their short-term rentals? Would that, would it go to that far or would you, do you need to speak to their town? Um, uh, 
Is there any subsection for non-occupied, non-owner occupied that differentiate, differentiates between whether it's an apartment or house? Because I think it's pretty, there are large, huge cabins being rented that of course would not be the housing for somebody for a long-term house. I think that's kind of piggybacks on what she was saying of what would actually be a long-term rental. No one's going to long-term rent a large cabin, right? But they'll short-term rent it for a family vacation. But if it's a lo if it's a non-owner occupied apartment that is being um, used, I think that that's a big difference in how it is affecting long-term housing availability here. And I think there should be a subsection between what kind of, um, and uh, can I make a comment or We're gonna do comments yeah. again? Yeah. Okay, yes. I'll come back to comments. Okay, are there any questions on Zoom? I wanna make sure I'm not missing anybody. No hands are up. Okay, are there any other questions in the room? Okay. Come on up. Oh, yeah. yeah, come on up here. I have a question on the grandfathering. Uh, name. Susan Fuller, Woodstock. I do have a short-term okay. rental, which was built to be a short-term rental. No closets would never be a long-term rental. Um, my question is, because I am grandfathered, they've given us this little term of uh, cool operators, rural operators. And that is a two year program that they seem to have that they said at the planning meetings to be set up. So is that what happens after that two years of this? And why, if this grandfathering is no longer available, is it not considered uh, circumventing the intent of the law, which was set up to grandfather it back in 1973? Okay, so so those your, are my questions. So your first question is. What happens to current? Right, uh, that two year, when they, they've given this um, $2,000 waiver and we were told it was gonna be like two years, then what happens? Because they, the under the one, uh, they say the administrative officer gets to make the new rules and sets the fees and that's uh, underneath in the, in their, um, what the rule, what the, duties of the zoning administrator is for the, so it says they get to make the rules, change it, do the moratoriums. What happens at the end of two years? It's like that changes. So they're taking away the grandfathering, but they haven't said what's happening after those two years. Um, so that was the question. Okay. And what's your next question? Um, I don't, uh, do you not see this as circumventing is that a question or the is that a statement? But the question is, do you not see this okay, that as circumventing the law? Opinion, but yeah, no, it's not a question. question. I'm asking a question because this um, the law was established. So is this not, my question is, is this not circumventing that uh, 1973 law for a pre-existing uses? The question is, is this circumventing? Yes. Right. Okay. okay. Is this the intent? Okay. Is this the intent? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, Gail Scatcherd, Woodstock. I don't have a short-term rental. My question is, how did you ascertain the 55 person, the 55 resident, and then the 55 non-resident? Um, equation. That's okay, thank you. Any, is that it? That's it. <laughs> that I can write down. Okay. okay. Are there any other questions? Yep. Come on up. Uh, David Hill, uh, Woodstock. Uh, I am an SDR owner. And I think the best question is how can I email all 10 of you? Laura. Um, all of our emails are on the website. So if you go into the select board and you look at the list and then you go into the trustees, all of our emails are on there. Okay. What if I, I, if I have, email him and yeah, forward it all. Sorry, well, I was just asking, we will stop his time. Will you? Everyone would, could email you be, would you be the clearing? Yeah. 
email me, which is eduffy at townwoodside.org. Okay. If anyone has a questions to me, I will then forward it on to planning and zoning anyone else. Okay. So you're the conduit? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I will get it. Yes, not immediately from me, but from someone in a reasonable amount of time. Excellent. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yep. Yeah, come on. Matt. Hi, hi. I'm Kevin O'Neill on Sawyer Road. Uh, first meeting I've been to. I do not own. Well, I I own and manage a short-term rental company in Killington, which I've been doing for 30 years. I've been a Woodstock resident for since 2015. Um, first meeting I've been to. So this is our town leadership, our select board right here that we're in front of. Nice to meet you guys. Just a couple questions. Um, with respect to transparency for our public officials here in town, as it relates to the conflict of interest, how many of our board members and town officials, uh, how many of you folks are involved with short-term rentals? That is a question okay. by way of transparency. And from there, uh, the next question is. That owns an STR? Is that your question? How many? Yeah, how many, how many of our town, how many town officials, Just the, select board, employees, anyone that's going to be involved in the processing of this proposed STR regulation, how many of those folks own short term rentals? Um, okay. okay. Yeah, so it's just transparency, right? So we, we know what we're working with, right? Um, second to that, um, I'm listening to the financial formula or lack thereof to incentivize an STR to an LTR. So is there, is there a formula in place for that? The math, is there, if you do this, you get that. Um, and then say one more time. I'm sorry. Can you say it one more time? I just want to make sure I'm writing it down. Sure. So, so really the concept is we've heard a lot tonight about collecting extra money and using that extra money somehow somewhere down the road to incentivize someone to convert an STR to an LTR, what's the math look like? What's the formula? How, how do you do that, right? So how will the program be administered? Is that your question? Yeah, Okay. right. You know, so how to, what does that look like? Um, and then finally, is this matter going to be decided by you guys, or is this going to be decided by a town vote? This will be just, this is, uh, this is an information session, and we will have a time when both boards will vote on it. So is it the board's intention to bring this in front of the town for a vote townwide, or is it the board's intention to vote on this matter at the board level? Uh, the way that the process is currently set out um, and the way that Nord is using the work is one or both vote. They vote, the select board votes on town things, the trustees vote on village things. In the absence of a petition? Um, I mean, that that is traditionally how we've done it. There are other options and um, that are available within the VSA. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Any other questions on that? Okay. Okay. So well, we're we're we doing have time for comments. Yeah. So let's we do. We also have a vote scheduled as well. Okay. Do okay. so I do that first, and we'll take comments? Um, I'm fine either way. If it does, let me see. So we've got that, and then so the we have the scheduling left, and then your vote. Um. And We've got about 20 minutes left, so yeah, I sure. think to make sure that we get those two things done and then we'll take uh, comments yeah. for the remainder of the time. That works, yeah. Okay. Do it. You're the chair. I'm sorry. <laughs> the vote's only us. Yeah, the village is not voting. Yeah, well, we can do that. We can do that with us. We can do that at the end if it's just stuff. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Could you move on the next? Um, we can do that. I think we can do I, that. I can wait. Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's, then let's, let's go ahead comments. and um, let's take public comments. Um, we'll do you again. Do um. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Right, so, if there's any public comments? Um, we have time for those. Just step name. And again, two minutes. Mm -hmm. President and yeah. 
Yeah. My name is uh, Julian Cal. Uh, normally accompanying me would be Sarah Penna, my girlfriend as well. She is not able to be here though. I live out in uh, Windsor, Vermont. I used to live in Woodstock. Um, I've been to a few of the planning commission uh, meetings in relation to the short-term rental regulations in the past, as well as Sarah. And we've uh, you know, spoken about our story in relation to short-term rentals since moving to Vermont and about talked about our advocacy in favor of the regulations. Um, to summarize that story for everyone who's present here, we moved here uh, in 2021 of June. And uh, before moving to here, uh, Sarah was already employed at Killington Elementary School and the Prosper Valley Elementary School. And I was already employed at the Woodstock Farmers Market and had my first day of work on my calendar. Um, we enjoyed our first year of living here. It's been fantastic, been a good time uh, since then as well. In 2022, we received a notice and were asked to leave our unit. Um, initially, no reason was given for that. The uh, house that we were inside had four units and none of the other three units actually received this notice. We were the only ones being asked to leave. After a dialogue with our landlord, we found out that it was because our unit was being planned to be turned into a short-term rental. Um, we were kind of becoming more familiar with the housing crisis issue as it relates to short-term rentals over the, that year. Um, and at that point, it was now very much in front of us and we had to move uh, because of that. It was very unfortunate. To my understanding, I don't believe that unit uh, actually turned into a short-term rental. I believe it now still operates as a long-term rental. Um, it was very unfortunate, and even since then, we've wanted to move back to Woodstock since then, but not only are the prices just too high for us, it's just, quite frankly, there's nothing that is workable for us, nothing that's comfortable. Um, We've spoken in favor of the regulations and the work that's being done on them uh, in designing them, and I certainly agree that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of work that continue, could be continued to be uh, addressed for them. You know, especially in regards to the distribution of where these short-term rentals are in the town to ensure you may not have certain neighborhoods that have uh, more of them or less of them. Um, and certainly in relation to the excess of finances that would come from the revenue of the program as well. I think there's a lot of discussion that has to go on in regards to what is actually going to be done with those finances. Yep. yep. Um, yeah, I just want to take a moment to share a story of an instance where something relating Sorry, to... Sorry, if everyone, if, if everyone comes up with comments and we have time, you can come back yeah. with your next comment. Cool. Thank you. I, I, just a couple of extra seconds. She's going to give you your time. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, essentially, it's one of the first instances where we had someone having to leave town because there was a plan to replace their unit with a short-term rental. And it just kind of sucks because my drive home tonight is 25 minutes. It's nice 25 minutes. I really don't mind it. But I loved when I was able to just drive a minute back home. I work in the village here, too, at Monver Cafe. So, you know, it's it was very pleasant being able to feel very, like, welcomed when first coming here, but then having to go to the next town over Been trying to get back here ever since we did have to leave, but still have not been able to. Um, so it's a very apparent problem, as has been stated, the SDR um, issue as a whole is not directly what causes the housing crisis. It may not even be like one of the biggest aspects of what causes the housing crisis, but there's certainly a lot of power within STR owners to help alleviate the um, the side effects that we're having right now of the housing crisis. And I think it's important that we entertain the ideas that are being presented and how to work closely between townsfolk and STR owners to find a healthy balance between um, these regulations. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Any other comments? Come on up. Come on up. Uh, Tom Wheeler, uh, village resident and STR owner. Um, I'm just going to comment on one part, the fees. Um, I think the fees proposed by the Planning Commission are excessive and out of reach of most small SDR owners. Um, one comment from the Commission states that the tax burden would be spread throughout the town rather than um, focused on a, on a few, but this inverses that and um, makes the tax burden directly on the SDR owners because of the high fees. We won't be able to recoup the cost of those fees on the short-term basis. So um, all I'm saying are the fees are too high and should be reduced if this uh, new ordinance is approved. It needs to be approved with lower fees. Thanks. Is there anyone else? Gina Oriyama, um, I'm Mark's wife. I live on the end of Randall Road, and I'm wondering why you wouldn't cap the number. I'm sorry, do you want an SDR? No, I don't. Okay. 
I don't like I, Mark said, we have no uh, stakes in this game other than I, my concern yeah. for the rural character of um, our back roads and uh, rural environment in general. And I'm wondering why you wouldn't put a cap on the number of um, of STRs and or um, home occupancies in an R5 district. Right now at the end of the Randall Road, we have one STR, one rumored STR and two home occupancies. So within a half a mile, square mile, we have four essentially home occupants and um, it, it, it changes the rural character of a place. So I would recommend that you reconsider caps for rural areas because I think one of the main missions of zoning and planning should be to uh, protect the rural character. I mean, understand that that's part of the mission. So I think that that should be a, a strong consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Roger, go ahead. Hi. Um, I and just want to say, you, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm Roger Logan. I live in Woodstock Village. I am not a short-term rental owner. Um, I think the town government and the, and the two boards in front of us are to be commended for looking into this issue and, and trying to start the process of addressing it. Anybody who thinks this is the be all and end all, or it's gonna solve the housing crisis is not listening to what the regulation, the people promoting the regulations and writing the regulations are saying and not listening to, not listening to the discussion about it. All we can do is use our governmental powers to start addressing the issues that we see. And I, I applaud the Woodstock Town Government and again, the boards in front of us for, for considering this and looking for a way to start addressing it. It's not gonna solve it all, but the whole point of having a government is to do public good. So let's give them a chance to do this. And if things aren't working right, let's look for ways to fix it. We have very smart people and very educated people working on this. So let's give them a chance to do a public good for this town. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Um, Jill has a comment, but I know someone else in the room has a There's comment. someone first. in the room that hasn't spoken that has a public comment? Okay, uh, then Jill, Jill, go ahead. Hi, my name is Jill Davis. I live in the village. I don't have a short-term rental. Um, and I wanted to support the pros, proposed regulations. I've been to many of the meetings. I've looked through what the ordinance is. And I suggest that these rules, like as Roger said, I suggest that we adopt these rules, which have taken a year to come up with. They're very, very much simpler than what we introduced four years ago. So they should be possible to enforce. Anything that you introduce change to is going to have some people worrying about what their future is. Let's try it. Let's see what the issues are. And then we fix the issues. But what the issue we haven't fixed right now that we have a chance to do is the impact that short term rentals are having on our um, hometown. So I support them. Anybody else on Zoom? Oh, we have someone. Oh, yeah. sure. Yeah, come on up, please. Hi, my name is Paula Townsend, um, Woodstock resident. I have an LTR. Um, so a few things. And first off, I hear what she's saying that this is an opportunity to address issues within the town related to short term rentals. I haven't heard a whole lot of complaints about them, though. And I will tell you, I have neighbors who just purchased have a short-term rental. The town has gained a young family with a toddler. They are able to live here and do whatever else they do. I don't even know. Having a short-term rental, they have been 
in business for the last five months and we didn't even know. I live right across the street. So are there some short-term rentals that are having a negative impact on their community? Possibly. That's a legal issue. Let's not fix a problem that doesn't exist. Um, individual problems need to be dealt with individually. Let's not punish everybody because of one or two. Uh, having a cap of 55 and 55, I don't think they should be equal. Um, and knowing that there is admittedly an unknown number of operating SCRs, creating a cap at all feels irresponsible. Let's find out really what those numbers are and then discuss a cap. Another big point for me is I've grown up in Vermont. I've worked in Vermont my whole life. We are a tourism driven state. Woodstock is a tourism driven town. And as someone who loves to travel, I love staying at small B&Bs or short term rentals. You get to interact with people who live in that community. It's more personal. It's often more affordable. Let's not limit the um, number of places that I can do that in this community or others coming in can do that. Okay. Time's um, up. You have to move on to the. Are there any other public comments? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, quick comment on we didn't discuss yeah. uh, Susan Fuller, uh, short term rental, Southwest stock. Um, we didn't discuss um, any of the bylaws, which I thought was on the agenda to discuss the actual bylaw changes and changing of the B and B a definition. I don't understand why we need to change it to must provide breakfast and not have cooking facilities. I know they think there's a loophole. However, the state has a definition for B and Bs. I don't see why we can't use the state's definition for a B and B for our town. It seems most logical. Um, another quick um, on the the comments, because I think we're making comments, is that the benefits of short-term rentals in our community provide supplemental income for people on fixed incomes to afford to stay in their homes. It provides a gateway to young people to afford buying a house. It allows families with children to afford to have a stay-at-home parent versus having to do expensive daycare. And that's something nobody ever brings up, but that's legit. Um, it can be a temporary alternative for someone who's out of a job and just trying to make ends meet. It provides local employment. Um, SDR owners keep their properties up and well-maintained. They use some of that earned income to help maintain the property and hire local workers. Hosts are hospitality ambassadors and provide guests with welcome that often brings them back for future stays and often to move here. And I think we really need to consider that when we're looking at this, taking 110 or whatever that little number is, and then throwing the money on the back of these people who are working hard to be here. Are there any other comments in the room? Brian Burns from Peabody, Massachusetts. I don't own a short-term rental in Woodstock, but I own uh, long-term rentals and short-term rentals elsewhere, kill including Killington and other states. And um, one comment about the infrastructure, I've had long-term renters uh, that I have moved those units to short-term renters. And I find the infrastructure impact is less for the short-term rentals because with long-term renters in there, you would get people with domestic violence issues, drugs, generating more trash. With the short-term rentals, there's less trash in the building. There's less calls to the police. I get less calls for complaints from long-term renters. I have a building that's a mix of short-term and long-term. And when the short-term people are there, I get calls from the short-term rentals about the long-term renters causing problems in the building. 
And when there is a problem with a short-term rental, a person comes in and they're a problem, they're going to be gone soon. So the town doesn't have to <laughs> deal with them after that. So those are my comments about short-term rentals. Let's just we end comments. We have about five minutes left till 7.30 and the board still needs to take a vote. Okay. okay, so let's take one more comment okay. and then finish up. Okay, come on up. Basically, Marisa Serafini, uh, and I'm a short term. I, I I live in a house that I rent short term. Um, I'm confused now at the end of this whether we're doing all of this to address a problem that's other than the housing situation because I really haven't heard what is the problem with the short term rentals. So that's one point. The other follow up to my earlier question. Um, how many, uh, I'd like to know how many of the uh, short-term rental homes can turn into long-term rental and whether they can be identified as both apartments and single family homes, because I think that would be helpful too, to, to understand how much we can potentially solve by um, clamping down on short-term rentals. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we have to end public comment at that point. Uh, we do have a hard deadline in a few minutes. Um, and for people who still want to ask more questions or make more comments, um, we have a range of joint meetings between now and April 24th when this ordinance will be in front of the board again to vote. Uh, on Friday, there'll be a trustee special meeting. Uh, on April 9th, there'll be the trustees normal meeting. On April 16th, there'll be the select board's normal meeting. On April 17th, there'll be a joint meeting again, uh, both boards to discuss goals for the future. Um, so those are four meetings the next three weeks that we welcome you to attend and make any comments or questions you have about short-term rentals in this ordinance. And we'll also have the questions answered as soon as possible for you. And I would just add on to that again, all of the, the email addresses for all of the select board and trustees are on the website all the time. You can email us about this or anything else. And ahead, we're Greg. taking a vote on. Yep. So um, yeah. last year, the uh, select board voted to put a moratorium on any new short term rentals. Um, that moratorium is ending at end of March. As this ordinance is laying in the balance, uh, the assumption, the goal is to continue this moratorium so no one will sign up for a short term rental between now and when the ordinance could go in effect to save them money and time. Uh, so the hope is the board will approve this moratorium to make sure there's less confusion for people and people don't spend any new time. It will only impact someone who wants to start a new short-term rental now. It won't impact anyone who has one currently. Is there a motion? Is there a second? What about the people that are All those not favor? necessarily a Aye. 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 No, thank you. Yes. All right. but I have a question. We have... Uh, the month of April is the month that people must register in the village. So the trustees never pass a moratorium. Right. Yeah. Okay. So it doesn't apply. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Motion. Uh, we wanted to, uh, you want to schedule meetings? Um, so, I, yeah, quickly, I, I emailed both boards uh, okay. over the weekend, a bunch of meetings. Uh, I kind of mentioned through some of them, uh, 417, the first meeting. Um, to go over an update for myself, uh, personal. Yes, we're still in a meeting, so if you could, uh, if you want to leave, that's fine. Um, but if you could just be quiet as you leave, so we can continue the meeting, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, Four seventeen uh, update for myself, personal policy presentation and discussion of select board and trustee goals. Uh, Four twenty four, uh, the vote on this ordinance that was in front of you tonight. Uh, May first, uh, presentations from department heads and committees and, com and commissions. Um, Conversation on the personnel policy, uh, May 7th, um, recap of the process, um, and then a discussion on goals and uh, outcomes for both board members. And then May 21st, um, a vote by both boards on the goals and the personnel policy. Um, Are you saying that those are joint meetings for all five of those? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And what time? Uh, 5.30 for all of them. Okay. So when do you need to hear back from everybody ASAP? Um, I would say in the next week and a half. Can okay. we schedule them? Okay. Thank you. I, I can resend the email too. Yeah, if you could resend the email, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. You're in my calendar. Yeah, you're Mine too. So, you wanna, um, uh, motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.
Okay. Um, motion for the trustees to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura.